How are you guys doing today? It is good to see you. Uh, my name is Colin. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to welcome you if this is your first time here. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us. Today's a great day to join us because we're, br- we're starting a brand new series in the book of Hebrews. For the next 17 weeks, we will be studying the book of Hebrews together. I don't know about you. I can't remember the last thing I have done for 17 weeks straight, but uh, in 17 weeks, we could say we studied Hebrews together. So uh, hopefully you guys are excited as I am for this because it's gonna be a great time digging into a book that's often uh, misunderstood or even often avoided because it's complexities and the challenges that it presents for us as we read through the book. And for those of you who are joining us online, svc.live, thank you so much for joining us, inviting us to wherever you are, and uh, we're thankful that you're joining us. Uh, But before we jump into the passage, um, I wanna encourage you guys, if you haven't already, to consider picking up one of our discipleship guides. Uh, I always make fun of the rest of our staff when they call it study guides, because it's something so much more than that. It's not just like a workbook that you do in the recesses of your library or at the coffee shop, but it's a discipleship guide in hopes to help you grow as a disciple of Jesus, not just you, but also your family, your kids, everyone that's in your household. And so if you're not familiar with these, what we do is we have uh, many gifted individuals in our church that have helped write and produce the content, men and women, all ages, uh, all different types of backgrounds that help put together this content to help you in your spiritual growth for this next season. So in the book, if you're unfamiliar with it, is at the beginning of each week, uh, there's this section that has this scripture and then there's this section that has the main idea of the text, and then a big blank page where you could take notes. And I've seen some of you bring this book out and you have the note page ready to go on Sunday morning, and you just make my heart sing for joy because you are using the discipleship guide as intended. It's a good thing. Uh, But if you didn't know, there's also six days of daily devotionals for you to do for that week as well that will help you further understand the text that we studied on Sunday. And then after the devotionals, there's different questions, whether it's for your life groups, whether it's for your families just around the dinner table throughout the week. And then there's sections for kids, your junior high and high schoolers. Um, I Little tip, if, if there's things in here that seem too confusing or too lofty at times, the greatest thing to do, and I do this myself, is I will cheat. I will go to the SVC kids section that Leanne and her team put together <laughs> because it is so good and so straightforward and helps me out understand things. And so if you haven't picked up one of these already, I want to encourage you to do so. It's $15. That just covers the cost for us to produce it, to get it shipped here and get it into your hands. We're not making any money off of it. So I won't be like diving into a pool of coins like Scrooge McDuck once the series is over like, Mwahahaha. no, that's not what we're doing. This is just to cover the costs. Um, and if that's a, a, a hurdle for you, please come talk to me afterwards. We'd love to get it into your hands either way. Um, but then also, if you're somebody who's like, you know, paper and hardback, that's so old school, I'm so new school, I only like technology, I only want those types of things, it's for free as a PDF on our website, summitview.net, uh, on our front page there. So please consider doing it. There's over 102 daily devotionals to help you in your faith throughout this summer. So we really hope it's a tool that will be beneficial to you. So uh, let me pray for us as we get going, and we'll jump right in. Father, we give you thanks for the fact that you have invited us to gather today and we have already recognized the glory and majesty of our Savior. That all of creation, while we were singing this morning, all of creation at all times is declaring your glory, putting on full display of just how pure and mighty and holy you are, God. So today as we we dive into your text and dive into your scriptures, we ask that you'd give us an opportunity to join in once again with that song of praise. Father, we we come to you this morning to delight in the words of our God. So we ask that as we open Hebrews chapter one, would you give us eyes to see and give us faith to hear that the word is come and that the word is here. And we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So you might be thinking 17 weeks for Hebrews, that seems like a long time, Why is that? What are we gonna be doing? And I'm saying, I'm glad you asked. We're gonna talk about that this morning as we dig into it. And so when we approach the book of Hebrews, there's a couple things to keep in mind as we approach it. So if you're not there already, go ahead and grab your Bibles or grab your discipleship guides. Opens to Hebrews chapter one, and we'll be digging into the very first chapter. Uh, And what we'll see as we introduce ourselves to the text and get familiar with the book, it's unlike many other New Testament letters because at the beginning of the letter, there's no salutation remarks of saying, I, so-and-so, writing to you, so-and-so, grace and peace, so forth and so forth, as you see in other New Testament letters. The author immediately just jumps right into the book without really telling us who they are. 
And so for us today in 2022, is it 2022? Yes, okay, I still think it's 2020, 2021, somewhere there. 2000 something. We know for certain that while we might not know who the author is of this letter, because nobody claims it, and it's something that's been debated over church history, and we're not fully certain of who received the letter, we can be for certain that the writer of the letter knew the recipients, and the recipients knew the author because of different circumstances and situations that were happening that are addressed within this letter. We can uh, deduce or we can begin to understand as we look at the argument of the letter uh, that it's most likely that those who received it were most likely Jewish Christians. They weren't Gentile believers that didn't grow up in the Jewish faith. They were, they were actually Jewish individuals that grew up in maybe the Jewish system of faith. And we know that because of the argumentation that we see throughout the letter. Uh, we also can make some assumptions that it's most likely that it's written to a group of believers who lived within a city area because this letter itself actually has the most references to cities compared to any of the other New Testament letter, as well as the pluralistic idea of worship of other things that the author begins to deconstruct and tear apart throughout the letter saying, you're tempted to leave Jesus for this. You're tempted to leave Jesus for this. And he, the, the author goes throughout the letter the entire time saying why Jesus is something better than those things. And that's why we titled the series Something Better. Because it wasn't just these first century Christians that were tempted to depart from the faith, but it's also us today thinking, is there something better out there for us? Uh, and that's what the argument that the author is writing throughout the book saying that Jesus is that something better. So again, we don't know exactly who the writer is. We don't quite know who the recipients are, but we do know that this letter is extremely helpful for us today. Despite the fact that we know that it was written sometime after Jesus' resurrection and before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, if you're familiar with church history, you know that Rome came in and pretty much took over the entire area, and in 70 AD, the temple in which the sacrificial system took place was destroyed. One of the arguments that the author makes in the letter saying Jesus is better than that sacrificial system, not ever alluding to its destruction or its demise. So we know that somewhere between AD 33 when Jesus was resurrected to AD 70 that this letter took place. So with those things that we do know, there's still a lot that causes us confusion. Uh, there's many passages that are hard for us to understand and that cause us to scratch our head. One of the reasons why we get intimidated by the book of Hebrews sometimes is because of the large quotations of the Old Testament that we find within it, and that's what we even see today is there's a lot of references to Old Testament passages. And so that's how we approach the book, and we might just be thinking, so why is this letter for us today? And I would just simply respond with the question of this. How do you think about a person who has struggled and turned away? Somebody who's walked out of the church, you know, we, we hear stories all the time today of people who have left the church after growing up within it because it doesn't seem to be working for them anymore or didn't seem real to them at some point. Maybe some of you are here this morning thinking, this might be my last Sunday because I'm just not quite sure Jesus is the thing for me. Maybe some of you are here this morning because it's been a long time since you've been in church thinking that Jesus didn't work for me. I went out and tried everything else, so maybe I'll, I'll come back and try Jesus again. Or maybe you're in here a parent of a young adult. You sent your kids to the camps. You prayed with your kids. You, you walked through them with discipleship things, but today they've decided to leave. So how do you view them and interact with them? Because all throughout this book, we see the author's pastoral heart encouraging its readers to hold on, to persevere. Despite whatever persecutions or strugglings or misunderstandings that we, we face, trial in life, this letter is to encourage us within our faith. The letter is for those of you who are feeling lethargic in your faith this morning, feeling pressure to give up. Maybe you're tempted to turn aside and find something else that's more rewarding, more palatable, or more convenient. This entire letter is an exhortation from one pastor to a congregation to not give up. So for the seven, next 17 weeks, we are going to continue to encourage you to not give up. This letter helps us to think about our own perseverance when we are perplexed or confused. But the way it does it is in a very interesting way. It doesn't necessarily give a ton of practicals. You know, that's one of the things that we appreciate about Paul's letters is that he starts off with a lot of theology and then at some point in the letter, he transitions into a lot of implications. If this is true, then this must also be true. 
Well, what's interesting about the book of Hebrews is that it seeks to answer our confusion, our, conf- our, our fuzzy minds with theology, not necessarily with a lot of practicals. It does it in a way that shows that all else pales in comparison to living a life with Jesus. It invites us to get our eyes off the temporal things of this world and calls us to fix our gaze upon Christ. The argument throughout the book of Hebrews would simply be this, that your perseverance, your ability to steadfast, your ability to withstand all the trials and temptations and the difficulties you will face in this world and remain close to Jesus is directly correlated to the clarity in which you see Jesus for who he is and what he has accomplished. So if you're fuzzy with your understanding of the identity of Jesus, you will be fuzzy in your thinking of the gospel, and then we will be fuzzy in our ability to persevere. If our vision is blinded by the world's delight, we will have a hard time standing firm in the faith in which we've been called to. So Hebrews seeks to shake the cobwebs and give us a cleaner and brighter picture And again, like I said, not necessarily with a bunch of practical how-tos, but with giving us a bigger and brighter picture of Jesus, who he is. So this letter is an encouragement to the struggling, to the failing, and to the faltering, those who are uncertain of what's going on. Seeks to bolster your faith with theology. One uh, writer, Dorothy Sayers, she was a contemporary and a friend of C.S. Lewis in the early 1900s. She, she was a really interesting lady. She was an author and did a lot of uh, fiction and mystery, but she also dabbled in the, the world of Christianity and wrote about Christianity. And she was actually a friend of C.S. Lewis, and they would banter back and forth about the faith in different ways and or write about it. And she says this about uh, what is going on within the church. And mind you, this is written in the early 1900s, but I think it's true for us today in whatever year it is today. And she says this, official Christianity of late years has been having what is known as bad press. We are constantly assured that the churches are empty because preachers insist too much upon doctrine, dull dogma, as people call it. The fact is the precise opposite. It is the neglect of dogma that makes for the dullness. The Christian faith is the most exciting drama that has ever staggered the imagination of mind. And the dogma is the drama. If this is dull, then what in heaven's name is worthy to be called exciting? The people who hanged Christ never, to do them justice, accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for the later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have very efficiently pared the claws of the Lion of Judah, certified him meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for pale ministers and pious old ladies. To those who knew him, however, he in no way suggests a milk water persona. They objected to him as a dangerous firebrand. Christ in his divine innocence said to the woman of Samaria, you worship what you do not know, being apparently under the impression that it was might be desirable to, to, might be desirable, on the whole to know what one was worshiping. He thus showed himself sadly out of touch with the 20th century mind for the cry today is away with tedious complexities of dogma. Let us have that simple spirit of worship, just worship, no matter of what. The only drawback to this demand for a generalized and undirected worship is the practical difficulty of arousing any sort of enthusiasm for the worship of nothing in particular. So what Dorothy is saying in this quote is essentially we've wanted to take away the theology or the depths of what the scriptures might teach us because that's just for the, 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 the pale ministers and the stuffy old ladies. That, that's not really helpful or practical for us today. But it's saying when we discard that, we actually lose the meat and the substance of the faith of the very thing that's supposed to encourage us and help us withstand the things to come. The things that are to help inspire our worship rather than just worshiping nothing and having emotional frothiness. We're supposed to have the substance that's gonna hold us when the tough times come. And that's what the book of Hebrews presents for us. Rather than being left to worship something we don't know, the book of Hebrews puts on full display this glory and grandeur of God, and it starts immediately in chapter one and verse one. Read with me. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. 
After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So again, notice, the, the author doesn't start off the letter with salutations and welcoming and greeting remarks, immediately jumps into the nature of God, the nature of God's revelation, the nature of the Son. And verses one through four to us, as we read it in our English translations, appears to be multiple sentences, but in the Greek, the, the language in which it was originally written in, it was just one long run-on sentence. I love run-on sentences, so this, this sentence is great. But this, one, we could say that this is one of the most beautiful sentences in the entirety of the New Testament because it talks about and puts on full display the glory of our Savior, his character, his nature, what he is like, all about who he is. So read again with me just what, what, what it says here in verse one and two. Long ago at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so immediately as we jump into the letter, we see that the author is setting up this juxtaposition between time and vehicles in which he used to communicate to his people. So it starts off saying, long ago. Anytime I read the book of Hebrews, I almost think of like that opening scene from Star Wars, like you just expect this like do 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 and I even have like the starry night behind me like we talked about doing that earlier this morning, it would have been good. I said, no, I'm not a nerd, we're not doing that. Yes, you are. I am. You're right. <laughs> I'm sorry. But no, like it, it, it visions up this grandeur of something, of this history and of this past, because what this passage is saying at the very beginning is saying God's story of salvation didn't start in Bethlehem with the birth of Jesus. You know, we sometimes think about, well, we only think about salvation and, and what God has done for us and intended to do for us when it comes to Christmas time. But what the author is here is inviting us to look back to even from the beginning of creation, the story of salvation has been at work. So it didn't just start in the manger, it started at the creation of time. And so when the author says long ago, it's supposed to give us this vision that God himself has always been a God who's intended to communicate with us. He has always intended for us to know him, to worship him. That's God's very first act of grace. So we don't need to wait till the manger or even wait to the cross where we see God's grace put on display. We have to see it even though the fact that we have God's word spoken to us as an act of God's grace towards us. That we see God desires for us to know him because without his self-declaration and self-revelation to us, we are doomed without it. We cannot know God without his revelation to us. So when we think about long ago, we, we have the entire Old Testament of documenting and showing different ways how God has intervened in human history to show us who he is, and he wants you to know him. And so maybe this is your first time here with us today, or maybe this is your first time back in a long time, and you're wondering, what would God have for me today, maybe? And maybe it's simply that, that God wants you to know him, and that he has spoken so that you would know him. Has anybody ever found themselves in a, in a circumstance where there seems to be a communication gap between you and the other individual that you're speaking to? Maybe it's uh, because there's a language barrier. You, you don't necessarily speak the same language or your first language isn't the same as the other individuals and you're kind of like doing this awkward dance to help one another understand each other, right? Has anybody ever found that, whether they're traveling abroad or just somewhere? Um, or if you're married, you know, your words aren't necessarily always the same words that your spouse uses. Or your parents, you know, there's, there's always these communication gaps that we have in these relationships. And what's amazing to me, what the author is saying here is that God has closed the communication gap. God has closed the language barrier and he has come to us to speak to us in a variety of ways so that we may know him. And he didn't just start that at Jesus. He did it long ago. It says he was spoken by the prophets a variety of people in a variety of ways. If you were with us when we walked through the book of Exodus, we saw God speak to Moses through the bush. If you were with us when we walked through the end of Genesis, we saw that God spoke to Joseph in a dream. If you studied the book of Daniel, you know that Daniel also was communicated by God through dreams. 
Elsewhere, we hear God speaking to people and the voice heard in thunder or a still small voice. Or my personal favorite, he spoke through a donkey once. (laughs) Various prophets, various backgrounds, various experiences, God continually overcomes that communication gap to bring his word to his people. And so what we need to do when we approach the the words from long ago, we know that they have of importance, but what was spoken in present time has even greater importance due to the one who was speaking. That's what the author is juxtaposing here. So he's setting up this idea of this progressive revelation, that God revealed himself to his people over many centuries, periodically giving them new information that built on but didn't contradict or deny what came before so as we are New Testament believers, people in the year 2000, 2022, we don't just discard everything that came out ahead of time, but we understand it for what it is. Maybe the best way to understand this is if we think about uh, the last handful of years in sports, whether it's hockey or soccer or baseball or basketball or football, uh, the introduction of instant replay. Have you guys, have you appreciated instant replay? Are you purists of the sport? There's a few purists of you, you'll come around, I promise. <laughs> But the joy of instant replay in sports is that when there's something happens on the field and they need to go back and review it and take a closer look at it, they get a multitude of camera angles. So sometimes you get like an angle in, in football down the sideline, but you can't quite see it because like somebody's literally standing right in front of the camera, so all you get is their backside and you're like, that's a terrible view. And then maybe they, they get a camera that goes onto the other side and then you can kind of see, well, does the ball cross the line? Does the actual base runner get tagged by the glove? And I know I'm mixing sports analogies here, but it's one of these things that we see these different camera angles and lenses that show this one play. And so the, the fact of the reality, the truth of what happens on the field and at that play doesn't change, right? Just because one angle's over here and one angle's over here, that doesn't change what actually took place on the field. But then something happens, hopefully, in most games, you get this camera angle that gives you a perfect picture of what took place. And that's what the uh, the author is writing here, is that in the past, if we were to look at God's revelation, God's communicative truth, God's glory put on display, we saw pictures and glimpses of it from different angles and different sides. Sometimes it was blocked and you saw a glimpse of it. Sometimes you got a fuller picture. But when you look to Jesus Christ, you see the full picture put on display the best replay, the best view, the best lens in which God's character and nature is fully put on display. Again, revealing to us that God is a communicative God. He is not silent. So he says, in the former days, he spoke through the prophets, but in the last days, the last days is a technical designation for the period of history that would be initiated when the Messiah came. So when Jesus came into the world as Messiah, that started the last days. So oftentimes we're like, we're waiting for the last days. Welcome, it's already here for you. So we are living in the last days now because the Messiah has come. But what the argument the author is making here is that since the Son has come, there's no need for further revelation. There's no need to look outside and continue to look for, search for more. You and I are to simply to look to Jesus, his character, his nature, his teaching, his mission. What drove him to show you what God is like? God once spoke through many prophets, but now, finally and fully, he is spoken by his son. One singular entity. But who is this person? Who is this individual? Read with me, starting in verse 2 through verse 4. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. So rather than jumping to what Jesus has accomplished, why he's maybe validated himself by his works and why his efforts, the author wants us to pause and stop and think about who is this individual that we're even talking about in the very first place? Why is he better? Well, first off, it says that he was appointed. He didn't rise through the ranks. He didn't earn it. He didn't achieve it. This is simply who he is. Often in church, we talk about what Jesus has done, 
what he's accomplished for us. And we, we praise God for the, the works in his ministry. We praise God for the, the death on the cross for our sins. We praise God that he resurrected from the dead and he ascended into heaven where he's now reigning and ruling. We enjoy talking about the things that he did, but sometimes we overlook the fact, simply the character and nature of who he is. We wanna run to his works oftentimes, but we can't divorce his works from his nature, from the very character that he has. Much like you and I wanna be loved and appreciated and embraced simply by who we are, not by what we produce and what we do, sometimes we miss that with Jesus. We simply wanna run to the things that he's done or the things that he offers us rather than just standing and marveling for the fact of who he is in the first place. And that's what the author is inviting us to do here. He wants us to think about who this individual is. And the very first way that he describes him, he gives him eight eight things, he says eight things about Jesus. And he says the very first thing, that he's the heir of all things. The heir of all things. And so this was a very significant thing in in the, the culture, socially and culturally, in the ancient world. The firstborn child received the wealth's family and estate. So it's essentially saying that everything that is created, everything that spiritual, everything physical, everything that exists, it's going to be inherited by Christ. Everything that's out there is going to be his. Everything created, everything God has ever touched belongs to Jesus Christ. And it's amazing to think about that, right? God himself, we believe in one triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who have always co-eternally existed with one another. So when it talks about here an heir of all things, not necessarily that Jesus was born of God and then rose through the ranks, but this is just kind of saying that, hey, he's the one who's gonna receive everything at the end of time. But when Jesus was here on earth, think about how he went to be in heaven, worship, glorified, humbled himself to come to earth to be a Galilean peasant carpenter who was crucified on a cross, is actually the heir of the universe. When Jesus was on earth, he owed little to nothing. He had no place to rest his head. He only had a few possessions, and one of them was a tunic which would be confiscated and gambled over at the cross. He was buried in a borrowed grave. But someday, one day, all that exists will belong to him. Everyone, people, angels, all the powers of the universe will bow before him like we sang in that song earlier which comes out of Philippians. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of all those who are in heaven, on earth, and under heaven. The son of God will receive everything. He's the heir of all that God has created. And then he goes on to say, the next thing is, he's not just the heir who will receive everything at the end of time, but he's actually also the creator of all things, so it speaks to Jesus's eternality on full display. Not only will he receive it at end times, he was the very one who created it in the very first place. He's the one who made it all. So think of all the beauty and wonder that's out there. That as we as Christians believe that we're made in the image of God and that we bear markers of God, so there's parts of us that have that same creativity within us, that we, we ourselves are to be creators in some degree. So even just this week, I was, I was appreciating the different creativity and the, the ability for people to create in this earth just this week. Earlier this week, uh, our, our executive team and our leadership team, we were able to go out to dinner with Pastor Michael and his wife Tiffany before they left for sabbatical. So uh, there was a handful of us that took him to dinner to pray for him, to thank him for the way he's led us over this past season, to pray for the next coming weeks. You know, kicked him out and said, we got this, boo, don't worry, we got this. And we had this meal And I remember just thinking how glorious of the creativity of the chef to take this raw hunk of meat and use the right seasonings and use the right temperature and the right pot and the right pan and the right flame and then paired it with all the right things and then not only just created this wonderful feast on this plate for my eyes to see, but also for my hands to enjoy, to to grab and eat with. And then not only that, taste buds to experience it and then a tummy to fully enjoy it later. The creativity of this individual was there, put on full display. And then later in the week, I, was, I had an opportunity to go to a concert at a, this scuzzy little hole in the wall and see a band that I really appreciated. And then I was thinking about, there's these five individuals on stage that are taking 12 notes, really, and craftily, beautifully weaving them together to write songs and lyrics that would move your soul and impact your mind and then the sound that you could just hear. And you saw the creativity on full display from these musicians. 
And even as we go on, we think about the different artwork that we see that in, inspires us and encourages us. As we read the words in our devotional guide later this week, we'll see the creativity of people, how they crafted sentences. And so we see people being creators of things. And we marvel at that. But what's amazing to me is that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. He grabbed a handful of nothing, made something out of nothing, hung it on nothing, told it to stay there, and the world was formed. You see, the chef that I appreciated earlier this week, the musicians that I appreciated earlier this week, the artists that we appreciate every now and then, they're still just borrowing resources. They didn't steward it. They didn't truly create the very substance of the things that they were making. But Christ, when he created the heavens and the earth, created something out of nothing. He's the creator of all. And so the one who shaped the universe and placed the created order into place can definitely hold you and I in the times of testing and chaos that we may face that would tempt us to leave him in the first place. Not only will he receive it when he is at the end of time as the heir of all things, but he's also the one that created it so we can trust him when we look at him because that's the character that he has. The author goes on to say that he's the radiance of God's glory, bringing to the idea of God's Shekinah glory that we would see take place in the Old Testament when there'd be a physical manifestation of God's glory for people to see. So when you see the glory of the Son, when you see the Son, it's a manifestation of the Father. It's the glory of God put on full display, which the author then continues on to say that Jesus, the Son, is the exact imprint, the exact representation of God. So we know that no human father is completely reflected in their kids. While there might be some really good representation by there, like so if you see my children, there is no doubt that they are my children. They've got a big old head, bright blue eyes, and this maniacal evil cackle when they giggle. They are a good imprint of me. They're not perfect. They're not a perfect reflection of me, but there's aspects when you look at them, you know that's definitely a Wetzler kid. What the author is saying here, when you look at Jesus, it is an exact imprint of God. If you were to think about it in the olden days when somebody would send a letter and they had this wax seal and they would imprint their signet ring on it, kind of making it a seal, he's saying that mark that would be in the wax, that perfect representation, that's what Christ is like. Or if you go to the zoo or an amusement park, you know, like the little um, memento creators, you gotta get your quarter out and you get your penny out and then you put the quarter in and then you put the penny in and then you crank the shaft, like just like, go real quick and then the penny shoots out and it's got like a little emblem of like, hey, welcome to the Portland Zoo. You know what I'm talking about? You guys have ever seen those? That's what it's saying. If you were to look at Christ, it's an exact imprint pressed upon Jesus, God. So when you see him, the, God, the glory of God is put on full display in the humanness of Jesus, telling us that he is of the same substance, the same essence, not just an external picture like my kids may be of me, so when you look to God, you actually see, or when you look to Christ, you actually see God. And he continues to go on to talk about who this person is, and it says he's the sustainer. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And when we read that, we might think about Atlas that's holding up the globe on his shoulders, right? Or if you've watched a lot of Encanto recently because of your children, you're thinking Louisa, right? Right? But that's not what he's talking about. It's not just this necessary of holding all things together, past, present, and future, which it's true, but it's also carrying things through to a desired outcome and achievement. So think about it this way. If Christ doesn't hold together what's taking place, it returns to nothing. The vastness of the universe, the billions of stars, the distance between the, each of them, the sun coming up, our gravitational pull, the spinning rate of the world, all the properties of the universe will act in a certain way because someone is there who created it and is sustaining it and will see it to its desired end. This is who the Son of God is. The creator, the heir, the sustainer, the radiance of God, an exact imprint of him. And then it gets to something beautiful. It says the purifier making purification for sins. So he's a purifier. 
As we saw when we looked at the book, as we started, the, the revelation that we got from the prophets was incomplete. And here he begins to make the argument that the sacrifices that were made before were incomplete. So later in the book, the author will tell us that the priests are standing continually to make sacrifices, yet we here see that this better priest has sat down after making the sacrifices complete, telling us that the work is finished. And what's interesting about this, if we think about if he's the purifier for our sins, that must tell us something about who he is being holy and perfect and righteous. And earlier this week, there was an article that came out that was talking about research within Christianity of what Christians believe. And this might surprise you, it definitely caught me by surprise. It was saying anywhere, depending on your age group, about 30 to 40% of people believe that while Jesus was on earth, he sinned. When he was on earth as human, that he sinned or he erred and was fault, faultful in some ways. However, if that's the case, he couldn't be a purifier for our sins. It requires a perfect, holy, blameless sacrifice presented before God to make sure that our sins could be taken away. And so if you're here this morning and you've, you've been investigating the faith and you maybe you've entertained that thought, I just wanna gently correct you, say like, no, 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 when Jesus was on earth, he remained sinless, holy, and perfect, for that's the only way that he could be a purifier for our sins. Because if he had any fault within him, we're still stuck in our sins and our trespasses. So Jesus was not only just the creator, the heir, exact imprint of God, the radiance of God, he was also the perfect sacrifice for us. And what's great is it says that he's now at the right hand of the Father. A place of favor and a place of authority. He's above all powers and rulers and cosmos. It talks to a certainty of a job done. Yesterday, the sun was beautiful. I was able to go outside. Who else mowed the yard yesterday? Anybody? We got a handful of you people. I was out there with a pickaxe, digging up roots. I was working hard. I was sweating. I was like Ben Stiller and Zoolander, just like looking really cool with my pickaxe. But when the day was done, you know what I did? Because the job was done? I sat down. Because the work was complete. I asked for a foot rub, didn't get one, but that's okay. (laughs) But I sat down because the work was done. That's what's being communicated here. Jesus Christ has perfected the work that's needed for our salvation. So he's seated at the right hand of the Father, not just sitting there waiting for one day to be returned and then being fed grapes while he waits. We also know elsewhere in the New Testament it tells that he's interceding for us right now. And then the author makes a strange transition to say that he's superior to angels. You're thinking like, okay, I get creator, you know, redeemer, priest, prophet, king, he's all these things, but now you're wanting to make an argument against the angels? What's going on here and what's taking place at this time, it was in between the Old Testament and New Testament being written and what was happening within the time. There was different books that would come out that would begin to tell us about or tell people to say, hey, the role of angels within Jewish worship. And so what the author is starting to say is, hey, Jesus is actually far superior to the angels. So don't be tempted to settle for something less. Don't be looking for something better because we already have it in Christ Jesus. Don't be searching for angels. And so this argument that he begins to make is saying, hey, be attentive to what's going on and don't settle for something less. And so why angels? Well, like I said, there's biblical precedent that the angels were an important role for God's people. In the Old Testament, we saw that they were there for guidance, protection, deliverance, or even brought judgment to God's people when they sinned. When the angels spoke in the Old Testament, they listened. So people began to elevate angels almost to this role of a priest, thinking that they would be able to mediate between God and man. And what the author is saying, hey, don't settle for something less. Don't go there. And so he begins to say, don't leave the heir of all things, the creator of all things, the redeemer of all things for angels. And it seems silly to be like, why would we ever do that? But aren't you and I just as guilty to leave the creator, sustainer, the redeemer for something that's created and something for less than? Aren't you and I just as likely to depart for something like that? We we won't necessarily face the same pressures as these early Christians did, but he's trying to grab their attention and are saying, don't depart from who he is. Don't depart from him. And so he uses this argument by making, using seven Old Testament passages to show how Jesus is greater than the angels, how Jesus is better than the angels. And he takes these different 
Old Testament passages, strings them together and makes essentially three arguments. He says in verses four through five, the son is superior. In verses six or seven, it says not only is he superior, he has a superior position. And then verses eight through 14, he has an eternal reign. And what's great about this argument of these seven verses that he uses, he grabs from all over the Old Testament. He grabs from the law, he grabs from the prophets, and he grabs from the writings of the Psalms to show that all of the Old Testament is a Christ-centered book. So anytime that you were to open your Old Testament, you're to look in there and see it pointing towards Jesus. And he takes these words that were originally applied to uh, Davidic kings or Old Testament kings and say they had an initial fulfillment in them, yet they all pointed to something greater. And so I'll read with me in verses four and five. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be a son to me. So the two passages of the Old Testament that the author quotes from are Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7. Those two, those two passages are likely linked to one another about the same time frame. Uh, Psalm 2 reflects a wartime environment and is probably linked to what's taking place in 2 Samuel. Uh, second, uh, Psalm number 2 is always seen as this messianic king who will come up and establish his God's kingdom and reign. And what's happening in 2 Samuel 7 is David is wanting to build a temple for God's people to worship him on earth and God to dwell with his people. But Nathan is telling the prophet or is telling David, hey, that's not gonna happen because of your impropriety with your neighbor's wife. But your son, he's the one who will build this temple. So there's this initial fulfillment that takes place. And so the author takes these two passages to say, those are realities then, but what they were really speaking to is Christ who would come. And then he makes the argument saying, angels elsewhere in the scriptures would be referred to as sons of God, but none of them collectively ever received the title son individually. No other angel was ever called the son of God. So clearly, this one we're talking about is greater than the angels. And when we see the word begotten, sometimes we think about, does that mean that Jesus was born of God? Did he come from God? That's just simply language that talks about a vindication or an enthronement of Jesus Christ. Much like how we see the Father's public proclamation of approval of God at his baptism, when he rises from the water, we see, this is my, son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's, a, that's an enthronement passage. Or when we see at the transfiguration, when he says, this is my son, listen to him. Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7 are simply enthronements of saying, this is who he is. Make acknowledgement, be aware of how he is, superior to other things. And verses six through seven gives us his superior position. And again, when he brings forth the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels wind and his ministers a flame of fire. So again, we see a word that can be a little confusing in there with the term firstborn, but it's just simply a biblical term that talks about preeminence or Jesus' right to his inheritance in which we've already covered in this passage, he pulls from Psalm 97, 7 and Psalm 104, 4, and he pulls these two passages together to contrast where each individual comes from. There's God, and then there's God's creation. There's an object of worship, and then there's an object that's worshiping. The angels declare the works of what Jesus has done, not the other way around. He says, why would you depart for something less? Why would you depart from the creator to the created. You see, angels were created to do things of ministry that are to be appreciated and acknowledged, yet we don't worship them for such. So the question for us is when we look to something for worship, to give us satisfaction, to give us meaning, are we looking to the creator or to created things? What does it tell you that one of the peaks and pinnacles of God's creation of angels worships Jesus. What does that tell you about his value and worth if even angels worship him? So right there in those passages, it talks about Jesus' superior position. And then lastly, we see Jesus' eternal reign in verses eight through 14. It says this, but the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. 
You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, have laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are your works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So again, as he concludes his argument wanting to show you that Jesus is something better than everything else, better than angels, he references Psalm 45, six through nine, which is a wedding psalm that would often be recited at a king's wedding. As they were uniting and setting up this future kingdom and establishment, they're saying, would this kingdom be one of righteousness, wishing times of eternality. King, would you reign in this way? And we all know that, that those are good wishes and good hopes for when you install a new leader, when you install somebody, you're saying, may this reign and may this time be something valuable, be fruitful, and will it last forever? It's good things to hope for and wish for, but we know on this side of heaven that will never happen. And so there was an immediate fulfillment when these kingdoms would get started, but we all know they met their demise, but we know that there's this coming kingdom that will have no end that actually is reigned by righteousness. We know that God's kingdom will, is eternal and will last forever. And then he goes on to cite uh, Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, where it talks about where the world changes. But Jesus Christ, he doesn't change. Things will weary and things will tear apart and things will break down. But his kingdom won't. It calls us to not put our hope in the things of this world. I just love the imagery. It says, you laid the foundations of the earth, God, recognizing Jesus for who he is, but that will perish. That will wear out like a garment, and then you will roll it up and bring something new and something better. And some of us know what that's like because even just this past few weeks for spring cleaning, you're getting rid of those raggedy old band t-shirts and all your tie-dye. Or Maybe that's just me. But there's at some point where we, we roll up old garments and give it away or throw it away because it's worn out and it's met its course and it's not due for anymore. We roll it up and get discarded. But at one point, the creator, the one who's also the heir, will roll everything up and put it away and bring something new because he's the power, the right, and the authority to do so. And who is that? His son the one that we're tempted to leave, the one that we're tempted to depart from the ten, the one that we're tempted to give away. And then lastly, he says this, referencing Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This passage is one that's often cited towards Jesus Christ and his ministry all throughout the New Testament, and it's talking about the work of salvation, something that we'll see repeated over and over within the book. And this argument, he's saying that Jesus is better than the angels because no angel has ever been invited to sit at the right hand of the Father. No one has except Christ. No angel was asked to sit down because none of them could accomplish the salvation work that we needed. They gladly rushed to do his biddings and the things that they wanted him to do, but they couldn't secure salvation for you or I. So verse 14, he even doesn't, he doesn't diminish the role of angels. He says, they're ministering spirits. They're out there for those who will inherit salvation. They're there for our, for our service to help us. However, they couldn't do the work that Christ alone could do. And so as we conclude and think about Hebrews chapter one, we might be questioning, what does this all mean for me? What do I do with this? And I would, I would simply submit this to you. You and I, might not be tempted to leave Christianity or, or leave Jesus Christ for Judaism, like the, the, the original authors were, or the recipients of the letter were. We might even be tempted to depart Jesus for angels. Uh, that seems too far and distant for us. However, all of us in this room may consider to leave it for other spiritual horizons. We may consider leaving the faith or consider leaving Jesus for something better, thinking that there's something better out there for us elsewhere, if we just went searching or if we tried hard enough or we, if we worked hard enough. What this passage of Hebrews chapter one forces us to think about, much like the entire book will, is why would you leave the one 
who's the heir of all things. Why would you leave the one who created us all? Why would you leave the one who is an exact imprint of God's glory and radiance? Why would you leave the one who's made purifications for your sins? You continue to go out there and search for something better, but you're not gonna find it. And some of you are in this room this morning because you felt that pain. I've tried it. There's gotta be something better. There is. Christ Jesus. So don't fall trap to considering that there's something better. Don't make the mistake of departing and leaving the one who's created you, who sustains you, who's redeemed you, who's interceding for you, who's far superior than even the angels. Why else would you look for something better when it's he himself that is that better? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for today, for the fact that you've given us your word and you've given us an opportunity to know you. So we, as we reflect on this passage that you've spoken to us, thank you for giving us your word that we may know you and see you and hear you clearly. Thank you for giving us your, your son, Jesus Christ, to be the one who makes a way for salvation possible for us. Forgive us of the ways that we're tempted even this week, this past week, this past month, this past year, these past season of our life to depart and leave from you because we think there might be something better for us out there. Forgive us for the ways that we've neglected to not see Jesus for who he is or solely just trying to uh, take advantage of what he's done for us. Even in this passage, it's so encouraging to think about how it says that there's angels that have a role that are going to minister to those who are recipients of the inheritance of salvation. So that's us, God. So if anybody is in here right now struggling and having a difficult time, would you, would you send your angels to minister to us in a way that is necessary and needed? Help us as we sing songs for the rest of our time together to actually get a big picture glimpse of Jesus, who you are. Let's not simply run to the, what you've done for us, but first and foremost, a joy and appreciate who you are, Jesus. The creator, the sustainer, the redeemer, the heir of all things, the exact imprint and the radiance of God's glory. Help that to be on full display as we sing to you. We pray this in his mighty name, amen. So what we're gonna do next uh, is, is take communion with one another. And so what you might've noticed as you walked in, you probably were to go get your coffee and your donuts. You're like, what happened to my little snack tray, my Lunchable? Well, we're, we're moving back to our, uh, just the more traditional way of how we've historically done communion. And some of you, we're gonna have tables in the corners. So in the back and in the front, in the corners, uh, we have the elements for you. And as we think about it, um, when you take the bread, think of the body of Christ that was broken for you. But we're not just talking about any ordinary body that was broken for you, but the body of the one who's the creator, sustainer, and redeemer. When you take of the fruit of the vine, the, the, that's the blood shed that would purify you for the forgiveness of your sins. And so as you get up and move to the sides of the room and take communion, one of the reasons why I appreciate us doing it this way is because it forces us to get our eyes off of ourself all the time and begin to see the expansiveness of God's grace and God's reach that he would save an individual like me, an individual like you, and the other individuals in this room. So when you get in line to cut somebody else off, you're cutting off somebody who's a recipient of God's grace and ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> but, the, but one of the joys of going to the communion table this way is to see God's work and glory on display. Next two songs also, the altar will be open up here also if you need to come forward and kneel and pray in any which way. But consider, this is the Savior we worship. This is the God that we have, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of all things. So when you're ready, please come forward and take communion.